I wish I could take this whole gang with me to Africa and sing at our campaigns out there. <laughs> you ready to go? <laughs> well, good evening, friends, and welcome to this, the final meeting of our revival time here. And I would take the opportunity uh, to express my thanks and appreciation to you for the joy of being able to be in your midst and to share God's Word. To be with the men out at the men's retreat was such a blessing. To be on both campuses certainly was a great opportunity. And my prayers will be that God will continue to multiply the ministry of this great church and congregation. You will be in our prayers. I would appreciate your prayers as I continue from here. I will be preaching tomorrow night at the men's rally down there in Pensacola, in Florida, and then start a men's retreat on Friday up in Akron, Ohio, as we go across your country. And your prayers will be greatly valued. And on to Michigan and New York, and then back to Africa on May the 6th. Uh, to work in a number of outreaches there, and on to Cambodia in June, and across to Peru, as we continue in this ministry of world evangelism. Uh, Jesus gave a mandate to go. Uh, and I often wonder, what part of go don't we understand? Uh, there's never been, uh, it's never been renegotiated. And we all have to face the challenge of going, whether it's across the street or across the seas. God has given to us all that commission. These were the final words of Jesus. And I believe they'll be the first words he asks of you and me as we go. And so we'd like to keep in touch with you. We have bookmarks out there that we give to friends who feel they can stand with us in prayer and keep in touch through the various bulletins that we send out. We do send out a special bulletin for those involved in the ministry of evangelism, whatever kind it may be. It's called Equipping Evangelists. And if you're interested in getting that free uh, monthly bulletin that goes out, uh, one, it'll be going out next week actually, the Easter one. All you need to do is sign up and put a cross next to it so I don't confuse it, your name with the usual newsletter that goes out as well and we would love to keep in touch our burden is to encourage people to do and to be equipped to do what Jesus told the church to do and that's so important and so tonight I want to turn to Mark's gospel uh, chapter 5 to a well-known story which I trust we'll be able to glean some important insights. I, I want to talk tonight about the nobody who became a somebody. The nobody who became a somebody. So Mark chapter 5 and reading from verse 24. And a great multitude followed Jesus and thronged him. But a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, if you take a pen and go through Mark's gospel and underline every time that word immediately is used, you'll find it used again and again and again, stressing the urgency of the book. And immediately the fountain of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, 
you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. May God interpret the message of that story to all of our hearts. Shall we bow for just a brief moment in prayer as we quietly tune our hearts and minds to what God has to say. Father, thank you so much for drawing us aside from all the activities of the day. We ask you to clear our minds, clarify our thinking as we gather tonight for the supreme purpose to worship the living God. We thank you for this beautiful time of worship in song that our hearts could rejoice in. We know that you dwell amongst the praises of your people. Therefore, we ask that you will stand amongst us in all your risen power and open our eyes to see eternal truth. We thank you again for being the light of the world. We ask you to teach us how to walk in the light. Deliver us from the snare of the darkness the falsity of the darkness. Teach us how to follow the light. We've come from different circumstances, different situations. We, diff we wrestle with many kinds of issues. There are problems in homes, marriages. There are problems with employment, financial and material problems. We wrestle with so many. There are problems of belief. We come tonight to seek your face, believing that Jesus Christ is still the great I am. We can trust you. You've proved through the test of time You've conquered every enemy, even our last enemy called death. And so we thank you we can turn to you in faith and take you for what your word declares you to be, the great I am, the son of the living God. We pray that indeed by his spirit you will draw near Touch every heart, relieve every pain, captivate every situation, bring it all under your supreme and sovereign control. Direct our footsteps as we step into the future. There are so many uncertainties, but we thank you we can find an anchor in the rock Christ Jesus. Help us to believe this. And so, Lord, as we consider your word now, make it relevant, make it simple. May it be God's word. May we hear that other voice, the voice of the Spirit of God, as he constrains us and draws us. Grant your blessing now upon this assembly, upon this congregation, we thank you for those whom you've placed in leadership here and for the vision. We pray for your encouragement. We pray for your guidance. We pray that this church will stand out as a witness amongst all that's happening and a representation of the living God. Bless all involved, every ministry, every activity, from the youngest through to the oldest. 
Use your servants to fulfill eternal purposes in this corner of your vineyard. These mercies we ask now in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. I think you will agree with me when I say tonight that as we analyze the ministry of Jesus, he had an amazing ministry. He preached to different kinds of congregations. And although much of his ministry he was preaching to vast crowds, there were also times when he would meet up with the individuals. And right through the life of Jesus, there are re records of the way he met people along the road of life. There was the woman at the well. She'd come with many burdens, gone through five broken marriages, living in sin. But Jesus had time to introduce her to the living water. Nicodemus came to him by night. He didn't want anybody to see who he was talking to. And he came with all his intellectual questions. And Jesus had time to reason with this kind of man and tell him that he needed to be born again. Zacchaeus could have been a good politician today with all his corruption. Tried to hide from Jesus and just get a glimpse out of curiosity who was the stranger from Galilee. And Jesus stopped him in his tracks and said, Hey, Zacchaeus, come down. There's business we have to do today. I did not come by here for nothing. I've come to meet with you. Right through to the time on the cross, in the toxic twilight moments of life, with two thieves and murderers flanking him on either side. One rejected him. The other responded to him. And Jesus had time to tell that moment, man in the twilight moment of his life that today you will be with me in paradise. Time for everybody. That's what we have in the story here tonight. Those stories of those interviews that Jesus had were recorded, friends, not for the sake of just interesting Hebrew history. They were recorded that we might understand what was taking place and recognize the relevancy of them to our needs today. For each one came with different kinds of needs in different kinds of situations. And Jesus was adequate for every kind of situation as he is for our needs even tonight. But tonight we have somebody here that was a nobody who became a somebody as Jesus burst into her life. I think we're all familiar with the story that, of this dear woman that had this blood disease for 12 long years. And then one day she meets Christ. What a moment it was. And I think the great distinction of the story was that not only was she healed, she was made whole. Jesus had done a total work in her life. So many today have had what you would call a kind of experience with Jesus, but are not made whole. We've come to Christ with our needs. We've come with our burdens. We've cast our problems at his feet, friends, and he has met those needs. But we've never understood why Jesus wants to reach out and make us whole. This story conveys something of the way he works. There are a number of things I want to draw to your attention very simply tonight, because I think we're all aware of the story. But there are issues here that I think we need to take into account. 
The first is that I'd like to suggest to you tonight is that there was a serious danger. A serious danger. We read these words here in verse 24. And a vast multitude, a great multitude, followed Jesus and thronged him. The crowd may have come out of a variety of needs, of motivations. For instance, they might have been, they, the multitude may have followed Jesus for uh, when a celebrity came to town, it was the popular thing to do, to make sure you're amongst the crowd to see what was going on and to hear what was taking place. And so they were there, the, them that were following him uh, for the sake of curiosity, for the sake of being the popular thing of the day. There might have been those that had heard about the miracles that Jesus had performed and they were the sensationalists and they wanted to see possibly a spectacular miracle to fulfill their curiosity about the stranger from Galilee. And so they came with that kind of expectation. Others may have come with a secret agenda. They wanted something from Jesus. They wanted help in some way. They wanted some kind of prayer answered. And so they were there amongst the crowd. Others might have used the occasion to give the appearance of being a religious person. After all, this was a religious rabbi that was walking through the streets that day. The crowd followed him. But here's the serious danger. Only one person encountered him. Only one person met him. Only one person went home that day, a changed person, never to be the same again. The crowd went back the same way they came. And they missed the occasion and the opportunity. You say, what's the serious danger? My friends, the serious danger is that we like the crowd. And we'll gather Sunday by Sunday. I'm sure we have a very high percentage of people in your city that are in church on Sunday. And we'll gather Sunday by Sunday. But tell me, my friends, how many meet with Jesus? How many return having received a touch from Jesus? How many return never to be the same again? Or are we just like the crowd? We enjoy the worship, we enjoy the singing, we enjoy the preaching. But somehow, we go home. And the reason why we came was never fulfilled. We missed the opportunity. We seem to think that another will come next week. We find that there is a serious danger when Jesus comes that way. Will you be tonight that one person that meets with him tonight? Or will you return home tonight like the crowd that day? What will you be? There was one person that was serious enough that could not afford to waste the opportunity and to meet with Jesus. The next thing we notice in this story, my friend, is what I call a sad disease. Here is a woman. She had known pain like very few had known in different ways. There was the physical pain of having a, what you would call a blood problem, a female condition, as they call it. And because of this, there were many related pains. There was the physical disease, but this wasn't the total disease. She had more than one. The serious and sad condition. There was for 12 years a condition in her life that was constantly deteriorating 
And the Bible says she was getting worse. Then you'll notice there was other pains. There was not only physical pain, but maternal shame. Because because of this blood condition, it meant that she could not have children. Her, re her reproduction potential had come to an end. We're not even sure if she was married. But one thing's for sure, she could not become a total woman. In those days, for a Hebrew woman to be alive, it was for one purpose, to reproduce. And if she did not reproduce, then she had failed in the reason for which she was born. Every one of us have been born for a reason. And the worst thing that can happen to you, my friends, is to go through life and miss the reason why we were born. God has a plan for every life. Before you were conceived in your mother's womb, you were conceived in the mind of God. Many go through our churches, and they miss God because they confuse the religion with relationship with Christ. She had failed in her purpose in life. She could not reach out and touch anybody because she would contaminate them. We don't know if she was married. It seemed as if she was alone in this story at least. And she's walking through life with a grief in her soul alone. And our loneliness comes from our lack of purpose. There was also the emotional blame that came her way whereby she would go to a doctor. And the Bible says she went to many doctors and she had all kinds of expectations and she'd sit in those doctor's rooms hoping that he could produce a formula, he could prescribe some kind of solution that would bring her out of this uh, condition she was in. But she would walk out of those rooms a defeated disappointed, disillusioned woman, and into the depths of depression, she would sink. She would begin to blame herself. People would take advantage of her. The Bible says, there came the time when she had spent all that she had in an attempt to try and somehow purchase her relief. And there was no social security. There was no system to bring help to a woman in this condition. There's all kinds of pains. People would abuse her because of her condition. But I think there was one pain that outweighed all the other pains. Because she had this kind of disease, she dare not touch anybody, lest they be contaminated. And there was a little Levitical law about this kind of person. It worked like this. If she came to the temple, they would reject her. The one place where she felt she could find acceptance and love and help would be at the temple. But when she came to the doors of the temple, they were shut to her because she had this disease that kept her out of the place of worship. She had this disease that could, could affect others. And there she is, a sad disease. Many have come to the church for help. What did they get? You see, they did an analysis after 9-11. Chuck Colson did an analysis after 9-11 because shortly after 9-11, Everybody was in church. You talk about full churches. But only lasted for 30 days, I believe. And then we got back to normal, whatever normal is. And Chuck Colson and his workers did an analysis of this. And this is what came back. That were people in fear and uncertainty, wanting hope wanting help, came to the churches and there was nothing to offer. 
We were so obsessed with our programs and all that was going on. We forgot that they were hurting people in our congregations that wanted a message of hope. And they went away disillusioned. How sad to think. The one place where hope could have been spelt out was lost. When I was down in Australia, the, one of the movements then asked people with life-controlling problems what, uh, where would they go for help? And 8% said they'd go to the church. Where the others said they'd go, I don't know. You see. I can imagine. You see. You see, she's come to the place of worship and there's no help there. Many attach that kind of importance. You see, friends, the house of God is more than just a building. It's a place where the glory of God dwells. It's a place where divine truth is declared. It's a place where contact is made with heaven. It's a place, friends, where destinies are settled. This is the reason why we're here. We're not just a spiritual club. We are here, friends, to meet with the living God. When last did you meet with him? This woman found that even that possibility was denied her. A serious danger, a sad disease. But then we discover a sincere spirit, verse 27 and 28. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. She wasn't allowed to touch anybody's garment. But she came to Jesus with such confidence, and by doing this, she was transferring her need, her disease, and laying it upon him. Little did she know the theological truth of that. Little did she know that when you meet the master, friends, you can transfer the guilt of the past. You can transfer every fear, all that's happened across to him, and he becomes the great burden bearer. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all, the Bible says. And she comes. But what I like about those verses is verse 27 says, when she heard about Jesus. <coughs> Some faithful preacher, somebody had told her something unique about Jesus. Whatever she had heard about Jesus had so motivated her that she was prepared to risk everything to reach out and touch him, even the possibility of rejection. But she knew that Jesus had said, he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And she comes in faith. Whatever she's heard about Jesus prompted her, motivated her, drove her to his side. What have you heard about Jesus? Is this possibly the reason why we have so many lukewarm Christians? Is this possibly why we have Christians that are semi-dedicated? Because we act from the revelation. Faith is response to revelation. And whatever we've seen and heard of Jesus, that's what happens in our lives. And for some, he just is an interesting historical figure, the founder of Christianity. My friends, that's not the Christ of the Bible. What have you heard about Jesus? For when we've heard the truth about Jesus, we can't sit back then, there, and do nothing. Something echoes in our souls. What she heard about Jesus. What have you heard about Jesus? Who is the one that we gather week by week to sing his praises, to declare his lordship? He is the son of the living God. He's the God of creation. He's the God that became flesh, so unique to reach lost mankind. He came and lived like we live. He was hungry and thirsty. He stood at an open grave and wept. 
He knew what it meant to be despised and rejected of men. And then the Bible says he dies on the cross. Not for his sins, but ours. I don't know how people can be indifferent to a Savior like that, and yet we are. And yet we treat it as just an interesting fact of history. My friend, he died for you and for me. He took every sin you took. He paid the supreme price, and he did not have to do so. But he loved you. He saw you in your mother's womb, and he could not let you go. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he's in that tomb. Guess what? The tomb could not hold him. Jesus rose and he conquered what mankind can't conquer to give us life. Yet tonight there are men and women that will reject that. They'd rather try and save themselves and live their own kind of lifestyles. My friends, there was something at stake when Jesus died on the cross. It was your never dying soul and mine. It was your life and mine. It was your eternity and mine. He saw it all across the kaleidoscope of time. He saw you where you are. He said, I cannot leave you. I cannot leave you. Thank God he came. We would be living in darkness. I would urge every member here tonight, use this Easter time to catch a fresh glimpse of the price that was paid and just how much your Savior loved you and that you belong to a risen Christ and you belong to one that is alive and interceding at the Father's right hand and is coming back again. You see, friends, when she heard about Jesus, there was no resistance. There was no rebellion. She could not stay away from him. Hear what Jesus is, who he is. She had to overcome herself because the moment you come into the presence, you begin to recognize your own insignificance, our own inferiority and insufficiency. She had to overcome all these. There was the crowd. What would they think? What would their opinion be? They could cast her out. They were the disciples. But the, what she heard created a determined spirit to meet with Jesus. Do you have that kind of determination? Do you follow Jesus no matter what? Stanley Jones, that great Methodist preacher to India in a day gone by, was invited to address a university student body in India. They were having what you would call a smorgans board of all religions, and they asked Stanley Jones to speak on the subject of the resurrection of Christ. And all the other religions had given their case. Stanley Jones stood on that platform and in the way he could do so, he declared the glory and the wonder of a risen Christ, as opposed to all the other so-called doctrines of reincarnation and all the other beliefs. There was a hush upon that vast throng of future leaders of India as they listened to this man declaring that if Christ has risen, it means there's an eternity. And if there's an eternity, there's coming judgment. When he had finished, he sat down on the platform. And the president of the university came and addressed the crowd. And said, ladies and gentlemen, if what this man has said is not true, then it does not matter. But if what this man has said is true, then nothing else matters. Amen. Nothing else matters. 
For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? A man's life doesn't consist of the abundance of things that he hath. Somehow we don't believe that. We live a life with a misplaced value. Yes, she is. From what she's heard, she makes a decision. Not privately so no one will see. Publicly, she takes her stand. The next thought is the special deliverance. Now, the disciples, uh, uh, Jesus, she reached out and touched Jesus. Jesus swings around and says, who touched me? And these disciples say, hey man, everybody's touching you. They all, there's a crowd here. But Jesus recognized her touch. You see, Jesus can tell the difference between a casual churchgoer and a truly hungry heart. We come to him with all our needs. He, he, he sees our superficial touch. He sees our sincerity. And where there is a sincere heart, that seriously means business, friends, he recognizes that touch. And he cannot remain indifferent. When last did you reach out to him? When last did you allow Jesus to respond back to you and make you whole? You see, I think we have quite an interesting thing happens here. And yep, comes the punchline of the story. Jesus swings around and says, who touched me? You see, I think maybe she would like to have touched Jesus, got her healing, and then disappeared in the crowd and enjoy the rest of her life. You see. Had she done that, she would have been healed, but she wouldn't have been made whole. Many want some kind of cheap blessing and then run away from the responsibility. My friend, listen to me, with privilege comes responsibility. To him much is given, is much required. Why did Jesus turn around and say, who touched me? Why? Was he trying to embarrass her? Make a fool out of her? A spectacle? No, friends. He wants to make her whole. He wants to do an in-depth work in her life. More than some quick blessing. Look what happens. Verse 33. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. A few things in this verse that I think we've got to remember. The first thing was, the woman knew what had happened. You see, when you meet Jesus, you know it. There is no doubt. You can't walk around saying, well, I think so. I hope you heard my prayer. Contact with Jesus leaves you in a position where you're never the same again. She was experiencing their friends that the crowd had missed. The leaders of the day had missed. Even the disciples didn't seem to know what's going on. He was seeking to get to the depths of her heart. Now look what he says. Look what happens. And the woman came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Her whole heart. This is inner healing. This is being made whole. This is more than just some kind of uh, physical help. This is Jesus getting through to the depths of her soul and making her whole. And she comes, friends, and she tells Jesus the whole truth about her life that she had concealed for 12 years. The truth about her. You know what? 
Jesus knew the truth already about her. It wasn't that he didn't know, but he wanted her to confess it. He wanted her to bring what she had covered up and concealed and camouflaged for so long. Tell me something. When last did you come and tell Jesus the whole truth about yourself? The Bible says, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But he that confesseth them shall obtain mercy. Jesus knows the whole truth about you and me, friends. Every lie, every falsity, every pretense, all the games we play and the masks we wear. But he looks into your heart, my friend, because David said, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you'll make me to know wisdom. We need to come with our hearts. When last did you tell him the whole truth? He knows about it already, but he wants us to bring it to his attention and bring it to the light. And the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is not a sin you've committed that he doesn't know about, but there's not a sin you've committed that he cannot forgive and cleanse and wipe out of your life and separate as far as the east is from the west. I don't know where we would be if Jesus could not do that. And the record is, down through the corridors of time, one by one, men and women have all come to the same place. And when we tell him the whole truth, it's the truth that sets you free, that makes you whole, makes you the kind of man and the kind of woman and the kind of husband and the kind of wife that God expects us to be. Some tonight would rather die than face the truth of their hearts. Don't deceive yourself. God knows what's gone on. But his grace is sufficient. But we have to come and bring it to him. How long are you going to live concealing, running away from the past? She comes and she tells him the whole truth. And the truth sets you free. Look at the significant uh, declaration at the end of the story. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I love this verse. Because this is where the nobody becomes a somebody. You see, when, you, when we started off, we read verse 25, a certain woman. Nobody. Nothing. Anonymous. That's your identity. But look at verse 34. Daughter, your faith has made you well. She's got an identity now. She's become a somebody. She's no longer just lost in the crowd. Jesus has singled her out and calls her with that precious name, my daughter. If there's a daughter, it means there's a father. If there's a daughter, it means there's a family. <laughs> Something has happened, friends from the loneliness of despair and being unwanted and rejected even by the church, Jesus brings her into his kingdom and calls her daughter to as many as received him. To them gave he the power, the authority to call themselves sons and daughters of God. A nobody becomes a somebody. She's in the family of God. The past no longer worries her because now it's a forward march. As a daughter, there is an inheritance. There is a future. There is a belonging. Never to be alone again. My friend, do you know Jesus like that? The Bible says he is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And that's what he wants to be to you and me. And the word says here, your faith has made you whole. I can imagine there were all kinds of feelings racing through her emotions. But it was far deeper now. Your faith 
has made you whole. Your faith caused you to respond to the initiative I had taken, and I came back to you and performed that wonderful, wonderful operation of reaching down into the depths of your soul and cleaning out all those fears and doubts and anxieties and everything of the past that has tormented you for so long. You now, my daughter, and I've never known a father that is not proud of his daughter. That's what happened. A nobody becomes a somebody. Do you know what? She went home that day like no one else went home. The crowds went back. They had a good discussion. They even had fellowship, cake and tea and everything else. They missed the real thing. One person went home different. Tell me something. How will you go home tonight? Like the crowd? Or will you go home with a new identity? Because you've met Jesus. And the nobody becomes the somebody. Because now that he's, she's in his family, she's his daughter, there are plans, she has a new nature, she has a new identity, and she discovers the reason for living. My friend, it's as simple as that. But for that to happen, Jesus had to come. And if this is true, then nothing else matters. I find it rather amazing to think that a record was kept of this story. You see, God keeps the record books. And the record is kept even now of where you're placed, where you belong, and what's going on. Isn't it time to come and tell him your whole heart? Let him cleanse out what needs to be cleansed. And then draw you into that incredible family. Some have come so far. They wanted that touch from Jesus, but they never opened their hearts. And so we live on the fringe. We never experience the joy of our salvation. We never experience the sense of being, being born into that family. It doesn't work like that, friends. Jesus wants to do a total work within all of our lives. And you can trust him because it's all on the basis of his love for you and for me. I want us to think over this as we bow in a moment of prayer and think over what we've heard tonight. Every head bowed and every eye closed. The nobody who became a somebody. Will you leave this building tonight? like the crowd or like this woman. He wants to do something special. He's passing this way for you to reach out. Oh, he knows the, cra the, cra the touch of the crowds. But when there is the touch of faith, he responds immediately. He's not interested in some kind of superficial kind of experience. He wants to do an in-depth work within your heart, a work of His grace. Oh God, I pray that the truths of this simple story recorded so long ago might be a message for each one of us. And if there are those here tonight who are suffering because of a variety of needs, needs Jesus, may we not leave like the crowd, and miss the opportunity. Thank you, you've promised to be with us tonight. You're passing by. You love us all with a special love. Help us to reach out. Give us the grace to come tonight and open our whole hearts as husbands and wives with the things and the secrets we've kept for so long. And to get rid of all that junk that has been stored up in the depths of our hearts for thou desirest truth in the inward part and leave healed and made whole by your presence. We're going to stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. 
Shall we stand for a moment? God has spoken to you, young man, and to you, young lady, husband and wife. You felt somehow that conviction. It's time to tell God.